Can I see the president? Good afternoon. So we are ready to start. This is a very interesting section. I think everybody will enjoy that. A lot of fancy uh, surgeons and a very high. It's going on the next hour. So the first uh, the section is going to be about expanding the diet. So the first speaker, the doctor, I present. So I'm presenting my donor proposal. I think we are very useful tool to uh, explain the donor proposal. These are my disclosures. I'm welcome to everyone from Pittsburgh. So I hope to talk about. Uh, I don't know, I thought we have to talk a little bit about the status of liver transplant in the United States. We all know that there's not enough livers for all of the people that need it. Essentially, that creates three main uh, problems for individual patients, about a 15 to 20% weightless mortality, long waiting times, and the fact that we can't offer a transplant to, uh, to everyone. And yet, on top of this, we know that live donor liver transplant has actually quite good results. If you look on the, uh, um, on the graph, it shows that the uh, uh, outcome with live donor transplants are better than those with deceased donor transplants. And yet, despite this, the number of live donor liver transplants, at least in the United States, accounts for a very small percentage of the total number. If you look on the first graph over there, that orange on top of the blue is the percentage of live donor liver transplant. It only comprises roughly about 6% of the total. So why have the number of live donor liver transplants been so low in the United States? Multiple reasons, uh, including the fact that we have deceased donors uh, here and that we're heavily regulated. But really the main reasons are that the complications when they've occurred, especially donor complications, have been very heavily publicized and have been risks to programs and individuals. And what that's led in the people in the transplant community to believe is that a living donor graft is a risky marginal graft that should be only used for very select patients. And so as a result of this, patients and their caregivers are actually very poorly misinformed. We're never informed about the possibility of a living donor transplant. So we've had the opposite approach. We believed in live donor liver transplant really as a uh, as a strong modality for all of our patients, adults and pediatrics, uh, doing roughly about 80 to 100 over the last uh, 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 five years on a yearly basis. It comprises roughly about 66% of the total number of transplants uh, that we do. Um, so quite different from the national statistic, much more akin to what we would see in uh, in the Far East. So if you're going to push live donor transplants, you have to know your outcomes. And remember, your outcomes includes those outcomes in the donors as well as the recipients. So in the donors, over the last roughly about 12 years, we've done roughly uh, just about close to 700 uh, donors now. Our overall complication rate is roughly about 15%, uh, of which 6% fall into the what we call a major complication. That's anyone that requires another intervention of some sort. Uh, our mean length of stay in donors is about five days. We do all through uh, using the U.S. protocol through an upper midline incision. This said that our mean length of stay is roughly about five days in our donors. We look at the recipient outcomes, our survival outcomes are roughly about five to ten percent uh, better in our living donor patients, as shown in the blue, uh, versus our deceased donor transplant patients per patient and graft uh, survival. 
And technical outcomes, which has always been uh, sort of the Achilles heel of living donor transplants, once you've gotten more experience with this, are virtually identical between our living donors and our deceased donors, and especially very complications, which are uh, often cited as the Achilles heel of this procedure. If you look, uh, our incidence of biliary complications in the living donor patients is roughly about the same between live donors and deceased donors. So we've seen tremendous benefits in our program from this. Uh, two main things that we've seen is a significant increase in our transplant rate, as shown on the left, and a treat and a significant decrease in our waitlist mortality. And these are important metrics because these are tracked by UNOS, and these are important metrics for patients because they tell them the likelihood that they're going to get a transplant at your center, and the likelihood that they're going to die while waiting for a transplant. So this is how we currently use living donor liver transplant. It's really the first option for all of our patients, regardless of what their mouth is, whether it's low or high, whether they're young or old, whether they're primary readings, or whether they're tumors or non-tumor patients. And people often ask, are there any recipients that we wouldn't uh, use a live donor transplant on? And my simple answer is no. Uh, in fact, there are many recipients that we only offer a living donor transplant to and don't feel that they're good candidates for deceased donors. And why do we feel that? Well, because a living donor graft, in my mind, is really the ideal graft. What's an ideal graft? An ideal graft is one that comes from a young donor, is not fatty, has normal liver function tests, minimal ischemia, and minimal reperfusion injury. And those, by definition, are the criteria for makes up what makes up a living donor. On top of which, this is an elective planned operation where you can optimize both the recipient as well as your surgical and your anesthesia teams, which can have a powerful impact. So why, how can we push the limits? Why, so if you want to look at that, think about why do patients not get a living donor transplant? It's because of one of four reasons. They're either not in the right meld number, they don't have a donor available, the donor is not suitable, or the recipient is felt to be too high risk. So let's look at each of those and how we can push to maximize living donor transplant. So recent publication in JAMA that showed that as low as a meld of 11 has a survival benefit with a living donor transplant versus staying on the waiting list. So if down as low as 11, if you have a living donor, you will get a survival benefit versus staying on a waiting list. What about at the higher melds? There's no restriction on what you can use. You usually using modified techniques such as uh, trying to use exclusively right lobe grafts, younger donors, maybe using the middle hepatic vein. You can do high melt patients, and this is our outcomes with higher melt patients, those above melt of 25. And you can see that there's virtually no difference in those uh, with uh, with higher melts. Number two, you can't find a donor. That's Yes, so it's going to be very hard for recipients to find a donor. It's a difficult thing to ask. So we help them to try to find a donor by finding a champion that will champion their cause and introducing them to social media, which really helps them to expand the circle in which uh, in which they can reach out to to find try to find a suitable living donor. Utilize non-directed or anonymous uh, altruistic donors at our center. It makes up roughly about 10 to 15 percent of the donors that we're doing. And we utilize these donors as part of an exchange program. So if a donor combination is ABO incompatible, we will use the non-directed to do a period exchange. And we've done 11 papers of 22 transplants just in the last three years using this. And if we can't find a suitable period exchange for them, using this protocol. It's much easier to do an ABO incompatible liver transplant than something like a kidney transplant, for example. In donor acceptance rate, donors are usually re rejected because of either anatomy or size. And we've learned that size is really a relative contraindication using uh, modern sort of outflow techniques, uh, using such as this to maximize the outflow and minimize your risk of small for size syndrome. And using modulation techniques such as this, where we uh, adjust perfectly the flow of portal vein and hepatic artery uh, in the OR to make sure that uh, the risk of small for size is low. And using that, we can get very good outcomes in what are considered small for size graphs, as shown here. Roughly about 20% of our graphs now are small for size, and there's virtually no difference in outcomes between those and our standard size graphs. And then lastly, in the high-risk patients, uh, those that are high meld have already shown you, but retransplants and elderly, again, these are the ideal graphs and therefore should be ideal for high-risk patients. And these are retransplant patients and you can see virtually no difference in outcomes uh, in, our, in our living donors and deceased donors in retransplants. 
And finally, for oncology, this is an ideal uh, uh, technique to use. Why? Because it allows them to have a shorter time to transplant, allows you to use adjuvant and neoadjuvant therapies uh, and, uh, and successfully minimize immunosuppression uh, in these patients, which is ideal for complicated tumors. So finally, in summary, I think it's time to change paradigm of how we think about liver disease and live donor liver transplant, at least here in the United States, try to catch up to what they're doing in the Far East. Remember, all of the rules that we have for allocation were, de were designed for a deceased donor where you have a scarce resource. But with a living donor, you have one donor and one recipient. And so the rules that we use for deceased donors don't need to apply. And we should really use the rule of, is it providing a survival advantage to our patient? And if it is, then a living donor liver transplant is a good option. So we should think of it really as our first option and not our last resort. I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you very much for the next presentation. I will next present Dr. Gorilla from Rupees about machine fusion strategies and liver transplantation. Thanks, uh, Ms. Silvery. I'm very excited to have the invitation to speak about hypothermic machine perfusion to explain the donor pool. In terms of disclosures, and this kind of importantly, I uh, do have uh, some disclosures that are relevant, which is uh, consultancy with the organ recovery systems, which sponsored and the development of the machine I'm going to describe in the pilot trial. Uh, which is a pivotal trial using this machine. I've had travel grants. I've also had other research support and also some federal funding. So uh, early on, I was one of the earlier people to be talking about uh, this technology as early as 2002, two, three to develop it. We did our first human transplant back in 2004. This was one of our earliest cases. One year uh, when I was at the uh, New York Presbyterian Columbia to, uh, to publish the first series really of any ex vivo fusion or uh, liver preservation in a transplant in a, in a human series. Um, and then subsequently, we, we broadened our work into uh, some marginal orphan livers that were essentially open offers that were turned down by an entire region. And those uh, initial phase one and two trials yielded um, some benefit, clear benefits in terms of early allograft dysfunction, reduction in injury markers, better um, respiratory complications, uh, and others, including shorter length of stay and also uh, some lower costs. Um, these are a couple of other molecular papers that we did. We started to work on some of the mechanistic um, pathways that are uh, 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 perfusion improves uh, outcome. The mitochondrial injuries are really um, some of the little running steps. There's been others in Europe, which finally Andrew Schlegel and Phil Dukowski, who have really uh, pioneered this and, and uh, further developed it. And we see over the years there have been a significant um, growth in, in the field since this. Uh, we uh, started to move from a prototype device to develop a fully portable device in, in collaboration with the industry, with the uh, organ recovery people. Uh, and really during that time, uh, there was really an explosion of technology in Europe, and uh, many papers have started to come out, including some real seminal papers showing reduction in ischemic cholangiopathy uh, of DCD liver transplant using hypothermic perfusion and, uh, and many others. And uh, in terms of, I'm going to talk a little bit about our trial, and then I'll go on to uh, the other trials that are out there. So this was the, the machine that we developed, uh, which is a full portable machine, the LifePort uh, liver transporter. This is uh, some uh, pictures. There's a little video showing uh, the liver donor perfusion with the effluent coming out of the vena cava. Cannulation is pretty straightforward. We developed some cannulas that are um, disposable, and we do. We have a dual uh, system. This is a oxygenated, pre-oxygenated. Um, effluent, so like a similar to the D Hope that uh, was described, and you see by um, other centers and other trials. Um, you can use this machine as a back to base perfusion, bringing the graph back and putting it on to optimize some of your logistics and to get the benefit of the redu reduction in preservation injury um, in, in, in a variety of types of donors. Uh, or you can actually initiate the perfusion at the donor site. The machine is, while well, it is heavy, there's we we'll actually have some specialized carts uh, that make it very easy to load this machine into an SUV and into planes um, without um, without popping a disc or um, having some severe muscle spasms. Although we do have a, an emergency break the glass flexor back on the side of the machines, but don't tell anybody I said that. 
Um, this was our pivotal trial. This is a randomized trial. You can see the centers are participated. We have nine centers in the RCT. I'll just go over it somewhat quickly. You can imagine what the uh, criteria were were pretty standard. And I'm just short on time, so I don't want to dwell on too much. But um, in the end, we had uh, 63 pump cases, 73 cold storage cases, and we compared them. The only real differences in terms of the demographics, the MELD scores, were somewhat higher in the um, confusion group, and there was uh, a bit of a preponderance of of uh, HCC uh, lower male patients in the cold store group. Otherwise, the groups were similar. Complications were definitely low in the pump group, and as well, we had um, low biliary complications, essentially no uh, vascular complications. One graph fell in the pump group, and you know, as you might imagine, oh, the uh, SL graph scores were improved lower in the uh, in the pump group compared to the cold store group. And if you break out the ECDs, that was even more apparent. Now. Obviously, these are these trials are difficult to de detect survival curves or uh, survival differences when you have such a, um, you know, we know that the results are, are really in the U.S. are so good at this point. Um, now, the other major study that's uh, underway, and this is some of these slides are from David Reich. He may, they may be more updated data, but this was the last data I had. Really, are they using the um, this um, VitaSmart uh, Bridge to Life device, which is a a stationary device that really needs to be done in the, in the uh, recipient hall can't be moved, and uh, they have a plan for 244 cases. Um, there is all endoschemic, uh, one and a half to five hours, similar um, te uh, temperatures. The flows that they run are quite uh, are, are significantly lower than hours, but they also early results have shown they have reduction in radiograph dysfunction, length of stay, and um, and I know many centers, probably some in the room, are uh, in, engaged and involved in this trial. Now, there's definitely, as I said, been an explosion of interest, and you can see all the trials that are underway. Uh, so there's really, um, we're at the renaissance really of hypothermic perfusion in the U.S., and, and obviously the European uh, groups are still um, continuing to add significance to the literature with uh, extending times up into the 20s of hours using even more marginal uh, old elderly DCDs, fatty livers um, as well. Now, this is our continued access. Uh, and these are, uh, this is essentially where FDA allows the, the trial sites to stay, um, to continue enrolling in a non minimized fashion. And I'll just talk a little bit about our center and how it's impacted um, our center and, and what the strategies are to use these, uh, to use perfusion to um, get more cases done. We've done 12 cases since uh, since uh, uh, October. Also, Northwestern has done some cases. Daniel uh, has the uh, uh, PI at Northwestern. And uh, really, a lot of these are open offers. These are um, the pump helps us facilitate logistics, patient prep, um, make cases that would be starting at one or two in the morning, start at six or seven in the morning. Um, we use them for all of DCDs that we would accept. Most older donors, uh, fatty livers over 20% macro, donors that have high FTs, or we anticipate long cold ischemia time for other reasons. Um, portal main thrombosis, sometimes stuff like that. Um, a lot of these are, as I said, are, are usually late reallocations or open offers, post cross claim DCDs, or if we have multiple cases in progress. So far, we've had great results with these cases. And I'll just show a couple. This was the first one we did, which uh, had an AST peak at 9,000. Um, we got the liver off early, had another case that was just starting. It was coming from uh, far away. I won't say where. And uh, we had to get it in, and you know we ran a total cold time of 13 hours uh, with a five and a half hours of pump time. And you can see the recipient uh, did well. The PKST is only 2,700. Um, this was a, an older donor where we actually brought the pump out. We knew we had it, uh, the logistics were good, but it was a 78 year old donor who wanted to start the case in the morning and uh, left basically left the liver uh, on the pump most of the pump time. Uh, account was uh, was accounted for the cold time. It was uh, only an hour and nine minutes. It was not pump time, and you can see that patient also did very well. Um, this was an 18 year old uh, out of Pennsylvania that was declined after cross clamp. That uh, we accepted the lower put on the pump. A young DCD that was good, but uh, we had some challenges with logistics. And you can see, you know, from, uh, almost 10 hours of total cold time. This was a macrosteatotic liver that we used, really to 40 percent. Again, with excellent results. Uh, this was this one was uh, you know like almost forty percent, and then recently it was eighty year old. And you know you can see the types of levers that we're using this for um, to optimize our uh, logistics. Another steatotic liver. Um, so this is uh, how we've really gotten to the point where we can expand our capabilities as a as a small to medium medium sized center 
and get more cases done without stressing the system. It's very easy to get these levels on the machine. It's quick um, and it's not very cumbersome. It's very safe if the machine stops when you're using in transit, unlike uh, the only thing of confusion, essentially you have a backup. Uh, and we've done some work in uh, looking at injury and how mechanisms work on the bile duct and um, transcription, transcription um, activation of, of inflammatory cytokines, et cetera. So really the key takeaway is this is really becoming standard of care, some sort of perfusion, um, emerging trials, new data, Hopefully, this will also allow us to uh, uh, aggressively utilize these DCDs and ECD lowers at a price point in logistics and technical burden that will be tolerable to the average center. Um, and there's still stuff to be worked out. And uh, some centers now have experienced with both monothermic and hypothermic perfusion. It'll be interesting to see how that works out. Just make some acknowledgments to the transplant, the perfusion, and also the lab and the research team. Thanks very much. So, Professor Thank you very much, and uh, thanks for including me in this session. So, um, presented this at uh, the Southern Surgical Meeting, and I'm uh, going to show uh, the data. Uh, from that time, uh, this was put together by one of our um, postdocs, uh, Frank Colombo. So uh, I'm a member of the Mid Medical um, Board of Directors as a disclosure uh, that has uh, really helped a lot with this trial. Now, um, we know we hear regularly about the large discrepancy between the number of um, recipients on our transplant waiting list. We hear a lot about uh, the numbers at the end of the year, and it doesn't sound favorable, but it is really not even uh, the magnitude of the problem that we face. So over the course of the year, 25,000 patients on the transplant wait list, and we're transplant um, roughly 9,000 in the U.S. Uh, we got to find ways, and uh, that's obviously the focus of this setting, of this session. How are we going to allow more people to get transplanted? Uh, there are a few options. One is, well, we could prevent uh, end-stage liver disease. Well, we do. We have done that uh, somewhat, Hep C treatment, uh, but we're not going to take away what we face, especially with our current uh, with steatohepatitis. Uh, xenotransplant, we're going to hear about that a little more later. Uh, increased living donor transplant. The, the final is um, take advantage of donors uh, that currently exist. Uh, and that's really the focus of the uh, project um, uh, that we're going to talk about today. So today, we uh, discard about 10% of all uh, donor organs intended for transplant, but actually the numbers are even worse than that. We only utilize uh, two thirds of donors who have an organ recovered for donation uh, for liver, and liver should be um, the third, the number one organ likely to be usable from a deceased donor. This problem is getting worse under. Uh, a broad allocation, not better. Um, so what about normothermic machine perfusion? This allows a real-time assessment of organ viability. The safety and feasibility has been demonstrated. Um, there's, uh, and I think you all are familiar with those uh, projects. We had gained a lot of experience with more standard organs as part of the uh, randomized Organox trial, and this led us to, to think about, could we use this technology to assess declined organs to be considered for transplant? In other words, those that had been declined by all centers that were asked, um, but were, we thought might be suitable. This shows the uh, Organox device. Um, this is a uh, assess of uh, cannulating the liver and placing it on the device. It's pretty uh simple uh straightforward process um so uh the study that we initiated um 
about a year, about a year and a half ago, uh, was to test the feasibility of this approach in 25 uh, uh, declined and intended to be discarded livers. Uh, so the idea was to take uh, those livers that we thought would function satisfactorily, place them on monothermic machine perfusion, testing, transplant uh, recipients who had agreed to this somewhat high risk approach uh, and look at six month uh, graft and patient survival. This is an FDA investigator initiated uh, project and we had to obtain uh, approval from CMS also. Now this isn't the first time this has been done. There've been several previous uh, studies um, that have had similar projects. Our viability criteria were a little bit different. I'll show those in a second. We looked, as I mentioned, primary endpoint, six month graft and patient survival. Uh, we're looking at a lot of secondary uh, endpoints um, also and some um, biologic uh, markers. Now, these are the viability criteria that we have utilized. This is based uh, somewhat on our own work, uh, looking at uh, discarded livers and past uh, work in this area. So we want to see a lactate less than 2.2 at two hours after perfusion. Uh, homogeneous perfusion, and then uh, two or more of these five criteria, pH maintenance uh, without uh, excessive bicarbonate need on the device, metabolism of glucose. But if there's bile production, we expect the bile production to be alkalotic. Some of our grabs uh, didn't produce bile and they worked satisfactorily. Transaminase levels of less than seven and 10,000 uh, in the perfusate uh, and homogenous perfusion. We have a number of stops uh, pre planned in this project. So after five transplants and after 15 transplants, we have a stop. We submit data to the FDA and our DSMB uh, before proceeding. Right now, we're in the last uh, phase of the project. What about our NM results? These are where the liver graphs have come from. Local Kansas OPO primarily to consider. This is a little bit of a busy slide about the donors, but what I'd point out, median age 42, median call time uh, six hours. This is a back to base study. Uh, median time on the device, nine hours, 31% uh, of these were DCDs um, and 73% from the Kansas OPO. Um, when we look at the uh, conversion rate, so it, this is we had discarded uh, of the livers placed on the device, we uh, transplanted 73%. Um, so six did not meet, six out of 24 did not meet uh, the viability criteria. 60% produced bile, but 40% did not, and they functioned satisfactorily. When we look at our recipients, um, we've had no cases of primary non-function, 31% early allograft dysfunction, no, not an estimatic ability structures, um, Median ICU stay two days, median hospital stay seven days, six month uh, patient and graft survival 87%. We've had two deaths for non liver related causes. Um, so, of our, pay, of our recipients, 80% have had malignancy um, for which they were not going to get a transplant. Uh, seven with intrahepatic cholangia carcinoma. Um, HCC uh, without, there was beyond UCSF, colorectal metastasis. I'm going to skip through, there's a couple of patients that I was going to show you about, but I'm going to skip through these. But suffice it to say, the recipients not have had a liver transplant otherwise. Uh, we're starting a multi center study about sites. Um, that we've approved, we've received uh, funding for to um, initiate this concept on a broader basis. So our NM findings, we believe uh, this uh, is uh, does work. Normal thermal machine perfusion is safe. 
uh, it offers the ability for more patients to get transplanted and uh, more or more livers to be used. Uh, and that this can offer transplant to patients who otherwise would never receive a transplant. Uh, we've received uh, some funding support from um, our, our OPO uh, and device support from Organox. There are a lot of people involved in this project um, uh, to make this happen. Uh, I'll stop there. We can have questions later. Thank you. Happy to introduce uh, Dr. Toby Zian. Uh, she will talk to us about normal, uh, sorry, inside of normal uh, vaginal perfusion. Okay. Good afternoon. I want to thank the moderators and the society for inviting me to present. So my talk is on NRP and how to expand the donor pool using that method. I have really no disclosures uh, related to this talk. Um, as uh, described in the past, you know, the, the DCD US data shows that the um, DCD rates are steadily um, uh, rising, but it's only 25% of all donors. Um, so we definitely have uh, need to work on that. And less than 10% of the livers um, are from DCD donors. So really a, a very small amount. Um, the discard rate, thankfully, is slowly uh, declining, but it's still 27% versus 7%. And there's been a lot of concern about the unpredictability of the warm ischemia time and, and, and the effect on that organ injury uh, and early experience with DCDs have shown, um, uh, you know, bad outcomes with uh, a known primary non-function, early graft allocation, uh, dysfunction, and biliary complication. So um, the uh, two-thirds of the discards are actually happening uh, early, and I think this is where we need to uh, work on uh, in order to uh, save these livers. And um, comparing ourselves to other countries, uh, certainly the, uh, the in Europe, um, I think we're, we're not doing great. We're somewhere in the middle. Um, but overall, each country really has um, doubled at least uh, their uh, DCD rates uh, over the past 10 years. So what is uh, NRP? Um, I, uh, this was first described in Spain a um, uh, long time before this was published. Um, this is the 10 cases that were described in 2007. Um, and uh, they were done in uncontrolled uh, DCD. So these are um, patients who were, had uh, femoral accesses after they were um, declared dead. Uh, with balloon ballooning of the of the aorta, and essentially what they use is an it's an ECMO technique uh, with oxygenate, oxygenating uh, uh, blood that was reperfused uh, at the normal thermic temperature uh, around 20, 20 degrees. And this is what we see. Uh, this is based on a pig. Um, this is 30, 30 minutes after cardiac arrest and 30 minutes after an NRP. And uh, if you do a thoracic abdominal NRP, this really converts it technically uh, to a DVD case and becomes very um, uh, um, very easy uh, recovery. Um, so um, this led to then uh, using NRP in controlled DCDs, uh, where cannulation, uh, depending on the country, can either be done um, before antemortem or postmortem. I would say the majority, uh, particularly in the US, um, the majority of the states are not allowing antemortem cannulation. Um, uh, how long does the NRP last? Somewhere between one to four hours where organs are being assessed um, and uh, ultimately cross camp happens and the, and the organs are being used. And communication is really key um, in order to um, uh, avoid any injuries. Um, there are two techniques. Um, uh, we've been involved, uh, particularly at NYU, where the cardiac team recovered these uh, with a thoracoabdominal approach, which was the most common that's been done in the US. Um, there's also abdominal uh, uh, regional perfusion where the uh, vessels can be assessed, uh, ad addressed uh, from, the, from the femoral vessels or intra-abdominally. Uh, so these are the two techniques that have been described. And why are we doing NRP? It's essentially to minimize um, the uh, effect of the uh, ischemia um, ischemia uh, increase the quality of these uh, of, of these organs and and improve the outcomes um the nrp activity in the us has been really dismal uh, it started in 2020 um uh, particularly from the you know the cardiac team uh, with young donors have been have been using this uh where I, I, then uh, the the livers have been used by the abdominal teams and but overall you know the numbers are rising but they're only compromised like uh, 34 uh, patients is 0.6% of all donors um in the us 
unless the distribution, um, this is a paper by, by Chris Coombe, uh, where the distribution is essentially like there's just less than uh, 10 uh, centers really um, uh, uh, doing them. Um, it has a lot of technical and logistical issues. Um, this is multidisciplinary team. There are very different regulation among countries, different protocols of acceptance. There have been injuries that have been described. And most importantly, and this is why I think it hasn't been really approached as, as, as actively than compared to Europe, there are a lot of ethical challenges. Um, here you can see, you know, there have been a lot of different regulations uh, according to the, to the to the countries. The no touch uh, time is different. The one ischemia time is also different. The antemortem substances or or cannulations are, are sometimes allowed, sometimes not. So it's 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 very different. It's difficult to extrapolate uh, some um, uh, meaningful data. Um, and the criteria of acceptance is also different. But in summary, if the liver looks good, is clearing lactate, the enzymes are trending down, um, the biopsy, uh, if needed, is good, the liver is being used. Um, the ethics, and this is a, a whole talk on its own, there have been a challenging uh, um, uh, discussions and debates about uh, should we do this? Uh, are we restoring brain reperfusion? And there have been many techniques that have been shown that uh, reassure that um, you know brain reperfusion is not happening by measuring uh, the ascending aortic pressure, clamping the vessels appropriately, and ensuring um, complete aortic clamping. Um, there was also a lot of challenges. Are we when or should we reinfl reinflate the lung? Um, and and are we resuming cardiac arrest? Is that an irreversible state uh, post mortem? And um, the alterations that we are um, doing on for end of life practice and anti mortem interventions. Um, but the benefits are there. Uh, it minimizes um, um, intrahepatic uh, the, the ischemic cholangiopathy, increases the number and quality of the of these grafts, and and certainly we need national consensus which address these guidelines. Um, the benefits are there, and they're widely accepted and and, and selected countries in Europe, and 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 it's standard of care now uh, compared to the standard DCDs. Um, it helps maximize the graft utilization, assess the quality of the of the livers. Uh, it has a low cost compared to, for example, machine perfusion, and uh, certainly certainly widened uh, the donor and recipient criteria. But as I said, uh, the data is very heterogeneous and, and this is only based on retrospective studies. Um, Organ utilization has been shown to uh, to improve. This is a UK study that shows that uh, using NRP has has increased the organ utilization uh, in livers by threefold. Um, and also, there's a nice paper that looked at salvaging the Klein extended criteria DCDs. Uh, these are 28 cases where 20 transplants were done, and they were able to salvage 20 uh, 20 cases uh, within a, a, a few years period where uh, the graft uh, the survival at one year was excellent. Was 95%, and the um, ischemic cholangiopathy was only 11% compared to 18%. Um, the experience in the U.S. is 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 uh, is not as as good as as in Europe, but again here confirming the results uh, that we see in Europe, where um, utilization is higher in patients who had a DCDs with NRP. So what are, what is the outcome? And I thought it would be worth to compare to um, uh, you know a, a country like in UK where the um, uh, anti mortem interventions cannot be done, uh, where the uh, ischemia time is slightly prolonged. Um, these are 70 NRPs that were compared to 187 standard um, uh, DCDs, and here you can see the early graft. Uh, um, uh, dysfunction, the PNF rate, the um, hepatic artery thrombosis rate, and ischemic cholangiopathy is uh, uh, significantly lower in the NRP group, and the graft survival is comparable and, and good. Um, overall, if you compare based on data, uh, uh, large data of over uh, 400 cases, the NRP cases uh, had a better graft survival compared to the standard uh, DCDs, and uh, there was a matched um, uh, study uh, from the French data where they compared NRP to DBD uh, and they had um, uh, comparable results. Um, cholangiopathy rate is actually very low, uh, 0 to 5% uh, based on, on which multicenter you use. And um, there have been also a lot of debate on the significance of the warm ischemia time. So there have been a push of, of increasing the warm ischemia time. Some even use warm ischemia time over 90 minutes. Um, this has led to widening criteria. So the age of the donor is increasing, the statotic uh, uh, percentage is increasing, the warm ischemia time is increasing, and also they're able to use this in sicker recipients and high mild reduce and uh, increase warm ischemia time patients. Um, so what does the data show? There have been um, uh, uh, another study that compared 
ERP. So in PHC, it achieves a similar post-transfer recipient graft uh, survival, and the rates of the of the uh, ischemic cholangiopathy were similar. There's another study that um, compared uh, the uh, normothermic perfusion uh, with uh, NRP, and here again, the utilization was slightly higher in the uh, machine perfusion, 85% versus 70%. The survival at two years were comparable in the high 80s and had similar post transplant outcomes. Um, they also looked at um, another uh, study looked at DCD, comparing them to the uh, extended criteria DBD with uh, microceratosis, um, uh, elevated enzyme, and extended uh, ischemic criteria. And here the complications were similar. Um, and one nice and elegant study, which I think is, is worth uh, looking into in the future, is looking at the sequential use of NRP plus machine perfusion, and this is a, a study from, from Italy um, that looked at the combination of both if the uh, DCDs are even more marginal than, than normal. Um, these are um, age over 70, um, ischemia times or over two, two hours, and et cetera, and they showed that the add-on of the machine and NRP had, had excellent outcomes. So in conclusion, I think it's a novel technique. Um, it increases organ recovery rates and increases organ utilization with excellent long-term outcomes. I do personally think it should be used uh, over standard um, uh, uh, DCD procurements, but we certainly need uh, better data than retrospective series. Thank you. Hello. Thank you, Parisa. And the next speaker is Dr. Kuhn, who is the CDL of the Transparency Thank you. Thank you to the HPBA for the invitation to speak here today. I have no relevant financial disclosures. So uh, when you look at the rate of deceased donors uh, per population or per million, uh, historically, Spain's always been the number one. Um, over the last year or so, the U.S. actually passed Spain for the first time. Um, so we deserve some congratulations for our efforts in that respect. Um, however, there's still lots of areas that we can improve on. Um, so when we look at DCD graphs, this is utilization of DCD livers that went to the OR, the United States, 27%. Um, so we're quite a bit lower than a lot of the European countries. Um, Belgium is high as 75%, down to about 58% in Spain. So what's different? I think there's a lot of factors that are different, but one of them certainly is they are routinely using machine perfusion, uh, whether it be NRP, HOPE, um, normothermic perfusion for many of their cases. So expanding the donor pool, I think it's pretty clear there's evidence that DCDs are underutilized in the United States. Uh, this statement, probably a little more controversial, I'm sure Dr. Humar will disagree with me on this one, but I think DCD livers have the biggest potential to expand the donor pool. Um, if we match the European utilization rates, even if you took just the donors that already go to the OR, that would increase the livers by about 1,000 per year in the United States. So why are they underutilized in the United States, and what can we do to improve this? So the why, I think it's pretty clear, um, you know, especially in the early 2000s, there was a lot of data showing inferior outcomes, both one year mortality and graph failure with DCD graphs. Um, and that was especially due to ischemic cholangiopathy. And as we all know, in the US, we do have quite a bit of scrutiny in terms of our outcomes, where even small differences in outcome can really make a big difference in terms of insurance contracts, referrals, other kinds of things. Um, Ischemic cholangiopathy, I mean, we all know that's the Achilles heel of DCD transplantation. Uh, initial reports described rates as high as 30%. I think most modern series, even with static cold storage, don't have anywhere close to that. But um, certainly this is still a big fear for most patients and most programs. Um, so what we've learned over time is not all ischemic cholangiopathy is the same. Uh, some forms like these top two are probably going to be problematic and may end up with needing retransplantation, while others that are more confluence dominant or um, less significant can maybe be managed with multiple stents um, and ultimately become stent-free and not lose the graft if they're managed appropriately. As well, we made big strides uh, last year where we updated the guidance for ischemic cholangiopathy um, exception scores. Um, so it was uh, said that patients should get a median meld at transplant for that area as opposed to MMAT, MAT minus three or some other score. Uh, and hopefully with MMAT, uh, you know, they may actually be able to get a reasonable graft to get retransplanted. 
Uh, I think one of the other reasons they're underutilized, dry runs, they're expensive. I think 30 to 60 percent is probably quite common for most programs. Um, and so, you know, when you're local, that might be reasonable. But if you're going to fly your whole team out, I think a lot of programs get discouraged by this. And obviously, you have to find the right uh, resource uh, consumption. Uh, I like this saying from Wayne Gretzky, you miss 100 percent of the shots you don't take. I think that's true here as well. Uh, but again, you have to balance your resource consumptions. So how do we improve DCD utilization in the US? I think we've touched on it with a lot of the previous talks. Um, I think machine perfusion is going to revolutionize this. I think there's many ways to do it. We've used a lot of these technologies. They're all good, um, but they all will probably have their own benefits and, and uh, drawbacks. So I'm going to talk just briefly about NRP. Marissa covered this very well in her talk. Um, so thoracoabdominal NRP usually involves cannulation by a thoracic team in the chest. Um, oftentimes the heart is restarted and perfusion covers kind of the whole body except for the um, head which the vessels are clamped. With abdominal NRP, cannulation usually in the abdomen um, and uh, uh, perfusion is really just of the abdominal organs only. Heart is not restarted. There's no perfusion of anything above the diaphragm. So uh, this is the approach we've taken with our program. Uh, what are some of the advantages of abdominal NRP in our opinion? Uh, we're currently using a total DWIT time of 75 minutes, which is a pretty big extension from what we've done before. I think this increases your likelihood of not having no goes. Um, you know, oftentimes it'll the patient will expire. They just expire at 35 minutes, 40 minutes, whatever your cutoff is. Uh, we recently increased this to 90 minutes, although we haven't done one at 90 minutes yet. Uh, we increased our donor age cutoff to 70 for DCDs. Um, and I think it really gives you some more data points. You get to see what the lactate's doing. Um, and if you have a borderline case, uh, you can assess it from that standpoint. It also gives you times to biopsy it. Um, if it's steatotic, you can go downstairs, look at the biopsy, whatever you need to do. Um, for us, we've performed it with uh, one abdominal surgeon, one perfusionist, and usually a procurement tech. Um, and then these are some of the, the data from Europe showing improved graft survival, reduced IC, et cetera. For us to cover that pretty well, um, so I won't go into that too much. Um, these were the two different cannulation techniques we used. So the abdominal cannulation technique, uh, I think our median incision to uh, NRP start usually about three or four minutes from that standpoint. Infrarenal aorta, infrarenal IBC, um, and uh, uh, occlusion of the uh, supraciliac aorta. Uh, we've also have some OPOs that have let us do uh, anti-mortem femoral cannulation which makes the whole process much easier, again, with very short start times. Um, the equipment we've used, this is our machine. It's very portable, uh, weighs about 40 pounds, um, and we can easily transport it, or relatively easily, I guess, um, in a plane, ambulance, et cetera. Um, our system's completely portable. We have a completely self-reliant team. We don't need thoracic surgeons. We don't need anyone else to come and do anything. And we've sort of taken the motto, if your hospital can do a regular DCD, uh, we'll take care of the rest. You don't need anything really special other than maybe uh, a little bit of extra time uh, while we're doing the case. Uh, to highlight that, we've done abdominal NRP in 13 different hospitals in five different OPOs and three different states. So lots of different places. Um, in terms of the cases, uh, our median NRP runtime has been 70 minutes. Uh, we usually keep it between 60 and 90, depending on logistics and how the graph's doing, et cetera. Um, liver utilization rate, 81% of the DCDs we've gone on, um, we've used. So um, our normal rate was probably not as low as the U.S. average, but certainly this is higher than, than we had and much higher than, than is the U.S. national average. Um, in the 11 cases that have a three-month follow-up, we had an EAD rate of 10%, no post-perfusion syndrome, no ICs, and 100% graft survival. But again, too early to probably say too much other than seems to be going well. Uh, so what are the conclusions? I think DCD livers are underutilized in the United States. I think the data on that's pretty clear, and I think we could do a better job and get closer to what Europe is doing. And again, I think the various forms of machine perfusion are, are what's going to help us do this. Um, I think DC delivers have the biggest potential to expand the donor pool. This is obviously an opinion. Others will, I'm sure, disagree with me on this, which is reasonable. Um, DC delivers are underutilized due to concerns with outcome and cost associated with the dry runs. I think all of these technologies will potentially help to reduce this. Um, you know, costs, I guess, uh, maybe you save costs on one end from no-goes and increase it on the other end due to equipment costs, et cetera. But again, those are things we're going to have to figure out. 
Um, and I think the new technologies, uh, regardless of what they are, I think those are really what's going to be game changers and allow people to pursue these organs more, get some more data points, and at least you know you're not going to have a PNF. And I think all of them have uh, shown reduced rates of ischemic cholangiopathy. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks to the organizers for the uh, opportunity to uh, present today. I'm going to talk about uh, organ repair in the setting of uh, expanding the donor pool. I don't have any uh, financial disclosures uh, related to this talk. Um, so when talking about organ repair, it's a little bit different than what we've been talking about before, which really is more about organ conditioning and assessment, which, which has been well covered. The, I guess the question of organ repair is whether we can actually take these organs that are either unsuitable by whatever technique you want to do to test them and actually make them transplantable. And this is going to be through uh, either therapeutic in interventions or graft modifications potentially reducing ischemia reperfusion or potentially inducing tolerance for, for better long-term survival. So what are the key questions uh, that I thought when I was talking about this is, number one is, how are we going to do this? Where is going to be the best place to do this? Is it going to be actually in the donor? Is it going to be ex vivo? Or is it going to be post-transplantation? What is going to be the duration of the treatment needed? So if you're going to start talking about ex vivo sort of treat treatments, we're going to have to be able to perfuse these organs for very long periods of time, potentially, to actually allow these interventions to act. And then where should these actually be happening? I'm going to talk a little bit about organ repair centers at the end. So these are some of the numerous uh, strategies that have been developed in the lab. You can see there's, there's quite a few here, and these are the ones that are really actually used in clinical practice. So we haven't gotten very far in the way of, of interventions for, for donors. And the reason is, is there is limited time to actually do donor interventions. These donor interventions affect all the organs. So uh, if, you're, if you're just looking to do a modification of the liver, uh, there's, there's a lot of other organs that are potentially going to be affected by this. You really can't do any uh, organ interventions in the cold. And uh, if you're looking to do things in the recipient, uh, graft injury happens within minutes of reperfusion. So there's very little time for intervention there. So mainly, uh, we've sort of taken the strategy of, of normal thermic machine perfusion uh, to actually do graft repair um, with the idea of, uh, of course, improving graft function, but then performing graft modifications and then also potential repair strategies. So we've already talked about the, the vital clinical study. This was mentioned in some previous talks, um, but you can see basically the premise here was to take discarded grafts test them using some certain criteria using normothermic machine perfusion. Um, and you can see you can actually transplant uh, several of these graphs that were discarded um, without, with very little PNF and, and good long-term or at least good short-term outcomes. There are some anastomotic biliary complications that do occur. So there's some improvement there, but there's also uh, several graphs that were actually discarded in this, this trial. So there is room for potentially intervening and, and making some of these graphs usable. So there's several different strategies to do this. Some can be pharmacologic. You can uh, modulate things through gene expression, either with AAVs, siRNAs, or nanoparticles, and potentially gene editing with CRISPR. So um, this is, uh, was a study that was, was done out of a year with Dr. Clavian's lab that uh, was able to actually show that you're able to keep and deliver sustain a liver functioning uh, for up to a week. So this actually gives you the window to potentially start to do some type of intervention on graphs to potentially make them usable. One of the uh, approaches, and, and as we know, the, the rates of steatosis and, and just the general morbidity of, of uh, the patient population that are potentially donors, we're seeing more and more steatotic graphs. Many of these are discarded because of fat content that is too high. So one strategy in, in ex vivo perfusion is to consider liver defatting. This was some work that was done uh, by one of our, our, our former fellows, Dr. Rashtok. Uh, in collaboration with with Marcus Selzer, who's one of uh, one of the one of my colleagues in in Toronto that that uh, works in in liver perfusion, 
And here you can see using a, a compound called DMP, which is actually a, a, a fat, it was a diet drug back in the 1940s. And you can see treating livers in an ex vivo setting with just six hours of perfusion. You can see a, a, a decrease in the amount of triglycerides that are actually in the, the perfusate. And you can also see an improvement in, in lactate com a lactate clearance as compared to to uh, glass that un just undergo normal normal thermic machine perfusion. And uh, on the bottom, you can see this is a, a Sudan red stain. You can see loss of of fat within the liver. So we've gone on to actually start to do this with with human livers. This was a, a steatotic liver graft that was was discarded. It was put onto our, our ex vivo liver circuit, and you can see after several hours of perfusion. Um, that, uh, of course, there's there's some lactate cleans, but the liver starts regulating the pH, so there's no longer need to, to bolus bicarb into the circuit. The pH returns to a, a more normal uh, physiologic level, and we start to see some bile production around 10 to 12 hours. So this is just, I think, kind of the beginning of, of, of what we potentially can do as far as graph modifications. And this, this is, I know this was mostly supposed to be focused on liver, but this isn't just limited to um, to uh, ex vivo perfusion for livers. There's the potential for, for other organs. And this is just another example out of our, our uh, perfusion lab in Toronto. These were basically uh, uh, kidneys that um, after a six hours, uh, or sorry, 60 minutes of warm ischemia, you can see on the blue line, after three days after being retransplanted re in a porcine model, failed to clear creatinine. With just normal thermic machine perfusion, you can see a slight improvement, which is the red line there, but you can see the green line after treatment with AP39, which is uh, um, basically reduces the oxidative stress um, in the organ. You can see almost a, uh, a, a basically return to, to what seems like a, a, a normal kidney or a kidney that has no uh, warm ischemia. So another example of, of being able to modify essentially an unusable graft. So we've also uh, taken this into pancreases and been able to actually reanimate pancreas grafts. This was a graft that, that basically was put in the cold for 24 hours and then transplanted. You can see after uh, 24 hours of in the cold and then three hours of, of normal thermic machine perfusion, we're able to, to reanimate the graft. And you can see these successfully work when they're retransplanted. All the grafts that uh, were not perfused, the pigs died. The ones that um, were perfused, we see a greater than 60% than survival. And, and if you look at the, uh, the function of these grafts, it's pretty normal. The, the loss of the, the pigs actually was due to uh, more to, because of bowel, injury, or bowel issues and not necessarily related to grafts uh, not working. We've also taken this into humans and were able to show also using discarded uh, pancreas grafts, we're able to perfuse these uh, grafts ex vivo and then um, uh, in a way of basically showing function, isolate the islet cells from them. And you can see uh, just using a glucose stimulation test, these islets function normally. And these were, were grafts that were essentially turned down for either whole organ pancreas transplantation or for um, uh, islet cell transplantation. So uh, just to talk briefly about uh, um, potential uh, organ um, interventions, we've, we've developed an organ regeneration laboratory in Toronto now. This is basically situated in our OR suite. So we have uh, three suites or three rooms uh, that are associated with this. One is, is developed to, is for cellular therapeutics, one is basically for thoracic organs for regeneration, and one is devoted to abdominal organs, um, liver, kidney, and, and hopefully soon pancreas. And uh, this is just a video. This is kind of what we think is hopefully the future of, of transplantation. This was taken as a uh, video that was done by one of our uh, colleagues to, to look at um, basically for a grant application. But this is what we hopefully think of as the, the future of, of transplantation and organ repair. And see all of the uh, all of the potential organs that could be uh, intervened on. So liver. Kidney and then finally uh, the uh, pancreas. In a minute. 
And so uh, lots of possibilities. I think the technology is there to actually preserve organs in a, in a normal thermic temperature outside of the body. And um, it, there's sort of the sky's the limit as far as uh, potential interventions that we can do on graphs to potentially create more, more donors for transplantation. So thank you. No. 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 So the next uh, speaker, Dr. Martins from Washington University School of Medicine, and we about cell transplantation. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to talk about this. I have no disclosures. So what I wanted to cover is a, a few pieces of, of xenotransplantation today. Why now? A little bit about why we think pig to human uh, a model is, is approaching clinical relevance. A little bit about what human experiences we're guiding this off of. Uh, what have we learned in the primate experience? A little bit about what we're looking at in coagulation and compatibilities and what our next steps look like. So without a doubt, why now? The, the strength of CRISPR to allow rapid targeted gene alterations to express transgenes to reduce antigen uh, uh, barriers has uh, completely revolutionized xenotransplantation in the last five years. And pair that with novel therapeutics, complement inhibition, uh, co-stimulation blockade, the combination of these therapies is really allowing us to take steps forward. And from the antigen binding standpoint, we see um, a, a series of, of uh, cross matches where we look at wild type pigs uh, on the left with the goal of getting them down to the background gray there. And with each genetic alteration uh, of gal, SEMA, and beta-4 gal, we see many transplant weight listed patients who are approaching negative cross match and uh, appear to have a significantly decreased humeral uh, barrier to transplant. And when you look at this across the whole series of waitlisted uh, transplant patients, IgM in the in the uh, Y and IgG in the X axis, going from uh, wild type to uh, single and double and triple knockout, you see waitlisted transplant patients, uh, many of them achieving uh, what is that box in the lower corner of transplantable barrier to transplant. And, you know, currently what we're seeing uh, is that with this reduced barrier, increased clinical relevance across all organs. So uh, without a doubt, the first um, uh, human heart recipient paired with decedent recipients of kidney transplants at UAB and NYU has shown us that acute hyperacute rejection uh, that was commonly seen across other backgrounds can is no longer an issue. Um, and that with the right pairing of, of uh, immunosuppression agents and the right uh, recipient and the right pig, we can, we can really achieve uh, uh, clinical gains. So if you look across all organs um, and across the model of what, what this next steps look like, you know, we've had preclinical and primate models uh, across kidney, heart, liver, and lung. We've now seen results of kidney and heart and decedents in first human use, and we know the future is long. You know, we we know there's going to be a lot of discovery and innovation that'll that'll continue to be reiterative. But uh, as liver and lungs are approaching these next steps, we're certainly learning a lot. So the primate experience has uh, been incredibly informative um, uh, in in a handful of studies. If we look at different components of how I've asked this question, it can begin to help us predict what we could see in, in human studies. So in the study out of Pittsburgh, we saw that orthotopic to primate uh, wild type livers reject very quickly. Gal, we can achieve five to seven days survivals. Um, and in, in many of these models, we're still limited by thrombocytopenia. Um, and certainly out of the Massachusetts uh, mass gen group um, seeing uh, a few years ago, prolonged survival uh, up from five to 29 days. Um, and in these settings, there's strong immunosuppression and, and very aggressive disruption of the coagulation cascade. But what's really uh, important is that in the setting of, of uh, looking at, uh, at liver function, uh, this, this graph here with the green line showing bilirubin ASD ALT, there's not significant uh, injury and there's a uh, function of these graphs for a prolonged period of time. You know, indicating that in the right model without uh, significant injury, uh, we can achieve long term uh, function across species. And how can we predict if primate um, data is going to be tra translational to, to the human model? 
primates in many ways are significantly harder um, to, to uh, A, cross match, to B, select, to, and C, to treat. So I think the, the graph here shows um, a handful of cross matches similar to what we showed before in, in human data. Um, and in this, we're looking at GAL and uh, GAL, beta 4 GAL, and then triple knockout. Uh, IgG and IgM binding, and and with the best reagents we find, we cannot achieve uh, any negative cross matches. Um, and in in this setting, it's rhesus macaque, and it's it's also been um, uh, uh, reproduced in in baboon and across multiple different primates. That as we humanize uh, the graft for for humans, as we get to triple knockout, that indeed worsens the match for for non-human primates, and and across all backgrounds, we've not achieved the level of, of uh, very low binding that we've seen um, in, in the human cross match. And, you know, when we look even further back in, in uh, the history of primate transplantation, Starzl in 1993 transplanted uh, baboon to human liver that uh, was into a hepatitis B HIV recipient. Um, and this graft achieved 70 day survival uh, and ultimately failed due to biliary infection due to surgical technique. But uh, in this model, there was liver function. And I think our, our best suspicion is that the, the current immunological barrier of the, the current pig models is, is likely um, significantly better than baboon to human. So it gives us hope that uh, we're, we're approaching an area of, of clinical relevance. There are certainly concerns that there's coagulation incompatibilities. Uh, many have been described, uh, both with platelet uh, interactions, von Willebrand, GP123, cell signaling, SGR, SERP1 alpha, thrombomodulin. Um, but some of these we think can be overcome with uh, improvement in transgenes. Um, and certainly the combination of antigen reduction, transgene, and, and drug uh, therapies that we have available, we have yet to see um, how close this is is to clinical relevance. So when you look at everything, I think the next steps are exciting. We, are, we have a lot to learn from, from what we've seen in, in heart and kidney uh, xenotransplantation human models. And I think these are going to be informative. So, you know, the liver xenotransplantation may start as a bridge. We don't know how long this bridge is going to be, uh, but we're excited to find out. Um, I uh, have to acknowledge the, the Wash U team, and I, I don't think I got the same copy of this picture that Dr. Doyle got this morning. There was a, I think I got the wrong one, um, Dr. Khan, but certainly I look forward to talking uh, more about this later. Questions at the end. Thank you. So now our last speaker, my very close friend, Professor Bauchi, his CV is so big, we not, don't have time enough to read all of them, but I can guarantee you guys that he's an expert in living down liver transplant, and he is now one of the pioneers of this new procedure that he's going to show us, the rapid procedure. Professor Bauchi, please. Thank you for the introduction. And to thank, I would like to thank the organization committee of HPB for having me here. And these are my disclosure slides. Is I have a consultancy to the metronic parameter and show through the revision software. So the problem here is we see lower hepatobiliary cancers are increasing, but also secondary liver cancers are increasing and the five year survival is this small. And there's a growing bubble of interest, especially in the secondary uh, liver cancer, like colorectal cancer, liver mass, where transplantation have been shown to be effective in certain subpopulation. So the rapid procedure, my task here, came from a certain a special country that has abundance of liver grafts. And the surgeon, a good friend, that removing the right lateral section of the section and putting the right lateral section was the initial idea. And the techniques keep from transplantation experience in combination with IPS procedure, a kind of two stage hepatectomy procedure experience. And the, the recent, the recent six centers in, in, in Europe, 
to show the 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 rapid generation and this is, this is supposed to be a happy marriage and um, in the context of lower setting which is not cirrhotic and not a low proportion setting uh, uh, but in cirrhotic setting where well, low proportion is these things are a little bit different and this kind of marriage is a little bit more difficult the way we understand the level of transparent is a typical kinetic interaction model, which is direct action, action interaction in inflow and inflow with respect to the river size. So, that all of those parameters change, then the other parameters are also changing in the interactive manner. So, that actually requires the interoperative hemodynamic. To, to make the system when necessary. Ceramic setting is a less arterial flow, but more abundance of positive flow that needs to be taken care of. actually, and should the showing that the world six to eight states. So that's going to be The size is not modified but we can modify them to control things. So these are the, some of the strategies that we use in the GRWR alternatives. So we are considered as the ultimate inflow modulation procedure as well. Uh, in 2017, which we put to the opposite side of transparent meaning is a patient. Sister, this patient saw around 81 days uh, and died after experiencing some of her size syndrome and recovered in Successful case was a couple of years longer. Now this patient is in four-year follow-up in 2021, 2019, so in 2021, and showing that in the low health, low pro setting with HCC, it is feasible. But this came about Sick, sick operation with similar thrombosis and high blood score. And I'm going to show you a very short video to be the limits. So, this was a young patient of 25 year old gentleman with Wilson's disease, a 27 month score with three encephalopathy attacks in the last three months, and only one available again in the family. And could produce uh, a GRWR of 0 0.48, a left lobe. The, the, the trombosis here, the large is that shunts the flow from the root, uh, which is like about a liter of a point flow, it's trombosed, as shown here. And the motion proceeded to Section the public base, and this is the uh, estimated graph of which the actual graph GRWR became 0 0.45 is a left lobe graph. 
distribution about to to the Linux. Oh. is open the floor is in the acceptable range and the shunt is closed the floor is excessive so we decided to keep the shunt open as a flow in flow modulation which Increase the portal pressure to 14 millimeter mercury. And this is pretty much a plan of the operation of the model of customers. And this is at the closure time. Shunt is closed. So um, this is the only possibility. The patient is discharged after two weeks. This is the volumetric regeneration by two, by 13. You see the shunt as well. And by 20, now the GRWR becomes 1.4. To show that the functional shift with the polymer scintigraphy happens over the weeks. And this is the second stage procedure. This patient was discharged after the first stage in two weeks and then came back to the hospital for the second stage surgery. And this is the uh, six month CT scan. This patient is alive after, I guess, 2.5 years right now. So. Uh, we had five cases of rapid procedure in Ankara University where I recent, last year came to Istanbul and three more cases into the, in Istanbul recently. This, you see the GRWR range is 0 0.26 to 0 0.51. And rapid procedure is a technically challenging procedure which requires both living donor and advanced HPV experience and can be implemented across Stratic liver disease scenarios with various degrees of hypertension. Can we see? What procedure offers us is graft volume is not important and GRWR becomes obsolete. Anatomy is not a limitation. The blood matching is enough. And small for size syndrome potentially may become history. And understanding in hemodynamics is required in the population of the disease side. Should measurement of successful procedure. This is the double occupant as a published, which shows so so that's a creative option potentially implying the second world these are like consensus this time. to Thank you. Exciting section, as I told you before. So, much time. We have maybe fifteen minutes for discussion. Question to Dr. Wimmer. As well as the last time, we showed the 66% of my question was you show that the survival, the survival is to GIWR is the same. So, why don't you be a relative? So 
Okay. Uh, just uh, one more question, then we go. So, uh, we in Brazil, in Brazil, we have a lot of issues with the financial on the public side. So, you guys are much ahead of us in terms of technology and the machine perfusion. Center was uh, the primary center using machine perfusion, but a very limited experience. So, I think it is two more metallic and 13. So, I want to ask a very quick answer from Dr. Gahira and Dr. the secretary implement. So, so let me know what your what it takes to Okay, so um, I think that's these are great questions. I don't think we know yet how machine perfusion uh, will settle out. So um, today in the United States are two approved uh, devices. There's a little different uh, concepts for how these may be used by the two systems. The uh, um, Transmetics device, the company does kind of a full service arrangement where there's a surgeon to go out, uh, do the recovery, put it on the device, man the device, bring it to the OR, you're ready to go. Um, the uh, Organox system is more of one that the center uh, utilizes. You got to have people with some expertise put their liver on the device. The company doesn't have anything to do with following that process. The costs are pretty dramatically different. So it's about, I, I, my take is it's about between uh, eighty dollars and $100,000 a case for the uh, transmetic system. It's around thirty to 35000 for the Organox system. But you got to have personnel. Somebody's got to man the system. So th there's, there are a little bit of apples and oranges. Now, to me, and maybe uh, Dr. Guerrero can comment a little bit, we, we are part of, uh, uh, there's a randomized trial he mentioned using hypothermic. The challenge, there's some challenges to me. Uh, the way that hypothermic is used, you take a liver, and, and I think you have to be pretty convinced that you think it's going to work, but it may be marginal. Put it on the device. Uh, Perfuse it, at least in the current uh, Bristow life trial, it's, uh, 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 I think it's 90 minutes uh, on the device minimum. And then you transplant it. There's not very good, uh, at least to me, viability cr criteria. So you don't really know, is this organ going to work or not? That's what, one of the advantages of the, and there's no bioproduction, there's no perfusate uh, transaminases, pH, et cetera, to check. To me, that's a more of the advantage of the normothermic systems. You can perform viability testing and have a pretty good idea it's likely to work or not. 
So they're kind of different organs that these are utilized in. Uh, I think CS starting from a financial standpoint with uh, uh, hypothermic may be better, but it's not going to satisfy the same needs as the normothermic it, to, to me. But I don't know. James, you have a different view? Yes. No. <laughs> you can imagine. All right. Well, I'm gonna, a fun fact the 23 years ago, the initial ex vivo uh, perfusions we did were normothermic, and we were using some discarded organs. And I came to the conclusion that they were, it required so much work with adding glucose and bicarbonate that the transplant community was not going to go from ice to normothermic perfusion. So then we said, well, let's do something a little simpler, more straightforward, that is you know easier to adopt. And so maybe I made the wrong decision, but here we are 23 years later, and I'm saying the same thing uh, as I accept that people actually listening. I think um, the one comment I would make about the viability testing, 100% normothermic perfusion offers great viability testing. On the other hand, certainly the Europeans have really um, those the FMN, uh, which you can get as a real-time sort of uh, color metrics, spectrophotonic um, way to test it, is, is uh, actually does have viability uh, marker potential, and, and they actually do have cutoffs where they will decide to transplant or not transplant grafts. Based on that, that shows you the, the sort of health and the viability of a mitochondria in the graft. Um, quick almost like blood gas analyzers uh, on the go viability testing from, for hypothermic perfusion, but it's clearly not quite ready for um, probably the U.S. market or consumption yet. So that's 100% true. But the other thing I would say is how many years were we slamming rivers in and, you know, not having any viability markers based on what we think? What we know is that the, that the perfusion increases the health of the organ, they reperfuse smoothly, and even these 48 and 50% macro rivers that we had uh, you know, issues with, you know, we knew they were going to struggle and we're going to be doing hemostasis for five hours and they were going to hit the ACs of 7,000. You know, those work so much better. But I think once you get your hands on the technology and you use it, slowly you develop your own sort of um, ability to understand it. Now, um, the price point, the simplicity, the backup cold storage features for hypothermic perfusion, I think, makes for a lot of centers, makes it, um, makes it preferable. But again, every center has its own needs, and you know, for us and my center, at the price point of you know eighty five thousand dollars, I can't afford. That's the profit margin of the program of the transplant, just about. So I can't afford that, you know. But but at a lower price point, and it's something simple that the surgeons can do, you don't need six people in the other. Um, you know, for us, that gives us just enough of a competitive edge to take the graphs that we otherwise wouldn't be comfortable using, we would be turning down, or we wouldn't be able to get done because there was no or no additional team to do the case. And, you know, really that's the goal is to just do more transplants. And it's within the spectrum of your own program. And every program has a different needs assessment. So that's sort of my response to it. Just to add a quick comment, we just started a program less than a year ago, um, and we've been using normal thermic machine and using it religiously now on all the CDs and all the marginal. We definitely increase our, our organ utilization. Uh, we struggle like any other program at the beginning, but it's, it takes a lot of manpower and a lot of expertise, but it's definitely doable and teachable to the... To the uh, I would to start with, uh, I think we got a lot of help also from the company to uh, guide us and, and, and so forth. And we had issues as well at the beginning, but now um, it's like with experience, I think we've got better at it. I have a quick question. Um, first of all, congratulations to everybody. It was really, really informative session. I have a specific question to Dr. Krohn. You said that you're going to increase the warm, donor warming scheme time to 90 minutes. And also, you have already increased the donor warming scheme to 75. What is your definition of the warming scheme time? Is this the time of uh, systolic blood pressure loss, or is this the extubation to the cardiac arrest? And also, additional question is, if you think, um, do you think that uh, normal semiconductor perfusion may allow a longer Donor warming scheme at time compared to usual DCD harvesting. And if you think so, then why? What's the basis? Yeah, thank you very much. Those are great questions. Um, so those are total D widths. So um, that's from time of withdrawal until time of perfusion that we, we've done 75 minutes. We've gone up to 90 with that. 
with static cold storage, we were going up to 55 even with static cold, which I know is longer than lots of people, but that's what we've been doing for a while. Um, in terms of uh, DWIT, the only thing we are using for the NRP cases is basically when they go into PEA or like SPP is less than 50 for your systolic blood pressure. We don't look at oxygenation or anything. For that, usually we want within 20 minutes um, that they're in PA until we're on the machine. Um, so that's usually, I don't, I think we've only had one case where it exceeded that. So, um, so that's what we use for that. We don't look at oxygenation at all. So if they desat and they're sitting like that for 50 minutes, it's fine. Um, again, it would depend on what the liver does. You know, we had one that was, uh, around 75 minutes and the lactate was not clearing. It was like a 60 something year old liver. We didn't use it. So, um, I think it helps certainly with regards to that. Um, and then your your other questions are what was the second one? It was oh the basis is, is the basis oh yeah right what's the basis the cold yeah so I mean I think every, no one knows this question we've used the other technologies I think they're also great I think they have uh, they all probably have their own niches um, you know specifically with DCDs um, you don't have a period of cold ischemia in between when you have your warm ischemia and you recover the graft. So um, I would say it's almost like a Pringle, um, but I mean, it's not, it's obviously different than that. But, um, you know, I mean, we people Pringle for 30 minutes and don't get too crazy about it. Um, so obviously there's no blood flow to the liver during that time. So uh, you immediately recover it without having a period of ischemia or cold ischemia at all in there. It's like immediate, you're back on. So, um, the liver usually within one or two minutes it pinks up. You see the bowel pink up. Um, I think with all the technologies with DCD, we've seen a huge advantage in terms of um, reperfusion in the recipient. I think they're all noticeable, whether it's hypothermic, normothermic, ex situ, or in situ. They all make it better. Chris, can I just make one comment about that? I, I think that we, that phenomenon is basically what we used to think of as a skin preconditioning, right? Because you, 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 like you say, you reperfuse the warm and now you've upregulated those those protective genes and we've done some work on this in the lab. So it's likely an ischemic preconditioning kind of phenomenon and that's um protective. Maybe one short question, a little bit technical, but um did you in your beginning of your case the first few cases, did you have more outflow issues or it was not a thing? No. I outflow yeah. Okay. Outflow is very important, but from the beginning, we use the outflow from left hepatic vein and middle hepatic vein. So we extend we extend the uh, transaction line, including the middle hepatic vein junction with the IVC. So we have a larger outflow accommodating the regenerating liver. Um, I think two more questions. I have one. one is again, this is a very interesting technique. Uh, learning from you by two cases. So, so as far where, because this is a procedure. So, my question to you is what's your, your tip? Still, beginners of this game. Is the patient that you suggest us to indicate? In a cirrhotic setting, because cirrhotics, there are certain levels of cirrhosis. If you pick a very bad cirrhosis, the, the, the cirrhotic part shown after the surgery or function not very well. So let me know uh, what, what your thoughts about the, the real indications to the liver function. Well, this is these are difficult questions. I don't think I now know the answer. We're having done just eight cases. We don't have 100% success. We lost two patients because of uh, public health either shunt dysfunction, not because reconstructing the shunt. So uh, when you depotalize the diseased liver, reconstructing the public health shunt is very important to control the hypoperfusion. This is what we learned. Also, learn that if the shunt is functional too much, is also to take the patient to the brain and uh, the male of the shunt. So, these, these things, uh, I think, uh, strongly emphasize the importance of 
a fundamental understanding and manipulation of intraoperative antibiotics and following up antibiotics in the selection selection Similar sizes. So, this uh, is not becoming an issue. So, the functional reserve of the patient is very important. I don't think the procedure is good for very high patients with urgent liver demand because it will take some time. And the function of the right look. The CT graphy studies also shows that the lower is functioning in the early is shifting towards the lower after two weeks. The last question, and Dr. Trevor, uh, I think I was very surprised uh, that you guys have a beautiful lab, so a lot of experience, and I was very interested in the, in the defective procedure, because as far as I know, Show that one of his indications was not a stereotype of over 20 percent. So, in the clinical practice, I guess the machine for that purpose, right? So, I don't know if I have showing over 20 percent. The interpretation will tell it should be 30. So, what kind of the breath results you know is. So, so, the, so yeah, no, we, we have um, the study that I showed was basically just preclinical. So these are all basically discarded graphs that um, were thought to be too steatotic for transplant. And those went on to, to potentially be defatted. Our numbers are very small, though, but, um, you know, hopefully in the future, that, that we would be able to to do it for for graphs that are, are going to be 50 60 70 percent that are that are not going to be user usable under conventional sort of techniques either with uh any of the the machine perfusion uh devices we talked about today questions for the floor no can I just make a comment in regards to that i would i would just say for people to keep in mind you know we're at the beginning and it's not you know, Tend to be very granular, like oh, it's a you know, it's either going to be this guy or it's going to be a successful transplant. There is a very, very large spectrum, right? So if you have a twenty-five percent macro liver, new junior tendon is on, patient with a porosis, you'd be surprised. There are graphs that get turned down that are usable by other centers in different parts of the country, and the spectrum don't. This is an art, right? So, so if my program, if you say, well, why do you need to pump a 25% macro liver? Because you can transplant that. You, you don't know all the about the patient, but the, you know, who you're attending is doing the case, who's available, who's anesthesiologist is. So, you know, these are tools that not only take something that's going to go in the trash and have a successful transplant with a tender length of stay. What they do is they give you confidence to do those cases and to take those livers. It gives you the surgeon confidence at two in the morning to say, I can do this case. I can do this case at eight in the morning. I actually did this last week. You know, I had uh, taken sleepy gummies and had a bunch of bourbon. And so I can't, I need six, seven hours of sleep. I'm, I'm just being honest. I mean, this is what it's really about. And I said, you know, have, put it on the pump and I'll be there later after I have my coffee. And that's, that's not, Consequential. I can't put it on $5,000 for it. I can't control that. And that, that's worth it. And you have to make sure you buy that. So to keep that into perspective, it's not an all or nothing. Besides, I usually think of it that way. The reality is, is there's a lot of other factors. 
application to come into play. Thank you very much. Thank you for a great session. Thank you for your time. Now, speaking of that, you know what I mean. No, 100%. 100%. Yeah.